This is part one of two of our symposium with Kingsley Dennis. Dennis, Ph.D., is a well-traveled explorer, both inwardly and outwardly. He is a sociologist, author, researcher, futurist, and poet. He holds an M.A. distinction in globalization, identity, and technology, and has a doctorate in sociology, and his research was on complexity theory and how it could be applied to new information communication. Kingsley is the author of numerous articles on complexity theory, social technologies, new media communications, and conscious evolution. Kingsley examines evolutionary cycles as well as our systemic period of upheaval and change from such diverse fields as climate, economics, politics, quantum physics, and sociology. He speaks of our current epochal shift where humanity has the potential for an energetic upgrade, an evolutionary leap. He collaborates with the new paradigm, Giordano Bruno Global Shift University, is a co-initiator of the World Shift Movement and co-founder of World Shift International. Kingsley is the author of After the Car, 2009, New Consciousness for a New World, 2011, New Revolutions for a Small Planet, 2012, The Struggle for Your Mind, Conscious Evolution and the Battle Control How We Think, and recently Breaking the Spell, 2013. He is the author with Irvin Laszlo of The New Science and Spirituality Reader, 2012, and just released Dawn of the Akashic Age, 2013. Kingsley has also recently published a book of his poetry, Beautiful Traitor. Kingsley says, I continue to research, write, travel, grow my own vegetables, and keep on seeking to understand life's mysteries. After all, it's only a matter of perspective. Kingsley's website is www.kingsleydennis.com Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free interchange of ideas. We are so glad you could join us, friends. Today, Kingsley Dennis is kind enough to join us for a new symposium as we continue consciously exploring. Welcome, Kingsley. Thank you, Susan, and everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. I'm Susan. I'll be hosting, and today we have with us Sabelle and Chipper Dog, and they'll be joining in the round table. And Sabelle, you have the first question for Kingsley. Yes. So Kingsley, you have said that we're entering a new epoch, a world shift, and that we are past the tipping point, in fact, that we're, we're in the beginning of the transitional period. Can you expand your thoughts on this? Yes, thank you, Sabelle. Um, I, do, I do make a point of, of referring to tipping points. Um, now, my background as a sociologist was to look at um, societies and the growth of societies and civilizations. And if you look at the pattern, um, the pattern of complex societies is that they go through moments of growth and outreach, and they consume more resources, and they often come to a point where their growth, in fact, is um, beyond their capacity of resources. And they come to a point where they often collapse. It is called the, the, the collapse of complex societies. Now, within the larger picture, I look at that, that we are also within grander evolutionary cycle. 
cycles and evolutionary cycles, they tend to, um, there's the, the phenomenon which is known as punctuated equilibrium, which came from actually from Niles Eldridge, and uh, this is at the heart of biologists. And what they found is that evolution actually is not a gradual growth uh, that we often think it is, but a static period, a long static period, and then a tipping point and a rapid period of growth. And, and this is when certain energies or um, social events or certain, uh, let's say, happenings in society, they converge together. And we can talk about this in a minute, these converging points. So what, what I see is that our complex societies, um, we have complex systems such as um, environmental systems, energy resource systems, social systems, economic systems, climate systems, the whole range. And what's happening now is that many of these systems are coming, are converging together. And they're, they're in a moment of disturbance and uh, a moment of fragility. And at this moment, then these systems are, are very close to, to tipping points and they shift very quickly. Now, when I refer to tipping points, I say that we've moved beyond it because there's a lot of talk at the moment about breakdown or breakthrough. And some commentators are still on the bench and saying, well, we could break down, we could break through. Now, I previously I was also considering breakdown and breakthrough. But the place where I am now is that I consider that there will not be a global breakdown and that there will be a breakthrough. The question is, how smooth or how rough will be that breakthrough period, which I refer to as a transition period. I say this because I don't feel or, or think or sense that we're going to have a global breakdown. What we are seeing are patterns of disruption in those converging systems. And those patterns of disruption are what I consider to be catalytic moments or crisis catalysts, which will um, serve to push systems or push the need for new systems to come in into operation or come on board. So we are going to see, I feel, um, moments and events and periods of disruption. They could be localized, they may be more global, such as economics, but they're not going to collapse human civilization, such as, you know, this talk about 2012 and the end of the world. Well, we passed 2012, it's not the end of the world. So what we're going through is what I call a world shift. That means shifting some of our systems and our models within this transition period to make them more functional and operational. So I refer to world shift as being this moment of transition, not necessarily all, all um, wonderful and smooth and Pollyanna-ish, but a moment of, of shifting our perceptions and awareness about what are our needs and what do we need to do to help smooth this transition from older models. And just to finish on that question, I, I refer a lot to the... Um, wonderful quotation from Buckminster Fuller, the, the great visionary, and I'm paraphrasing, but what he said more or less was, you don't change existing systems by fighting them, you create alternative models to replace the existing systems. And I think that, that wonderfully sums up what's happening in this transition period. So I guess I have a question about how we're defining breakdown, because some people are seeing collapse and some people are seeing just dysfunction. So like, you know, the healthcare system is dysfunctional, the, the economic system is dysfunctional. And is that enough of a, a breakdown for us to choose to do something else? You know, I, I don't see us going into like a Mad Max scenario or a, you know, extinction event or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the systems have to be 
dysfunctional enough that someone chooses something else. Yes, yeah, I, I do, I do totally agree. And though there will, when we talk about breakdown, I try to make a, a separation between this um, idea, as you mentioned, Mad Max, global apocalypse, this end of the world um, idea of breakdown. You know, I try to stay away from that because it's important that that we do focus on a what is wrong, but how can we um, how can we participate and and um, and assist this shift, not to focus on negativity or breakdown. So, I I I, I as the word you use is functional. I, I like to use that word also. Certain systems and incumbent models are dysfunctional and um, they do need replacing and new models coming online. So in that sense, we can see specific breakdowns, such as in certain social systems or economic systems. So we can use breakdown with a small um, letter B. What, I, what I'm not referring to is the capital uh, breakdown, i.e. human civilization is going to implode uh, like the Roman Empire, for example. So we should be aware that there will be some disruptions and some some degrees, various degrees of breakdown in human social systems and international systems. But we we can move beyond that. These are not uh, these are not going to stop the whole human project, so to speak. Yeah, I've seen some people that are. It's like they're waiting for the train to wreck so there's opportunity to do something else. It's like, are we there yet? <laughs> and now I'm kind of thinking it's more like when you, you get divorced. It, you, know, you think about it for a couple of years of, geez, do I really want to get divorced? And and then you finally come to the decision, yeah, I want to get divorced. And, and then there's another year to do the actual that process. So this whole transformation process is it. You know, how are we looking for something, you know, dramatic or are we looking for something like gradual changes? Well, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good observation. And I, I, I don't feel there's going to be one particular answer. I think it'll be a combination. And in some ways, you know, it may sad to say that um, we do require shock sometimes. There's a um, you know, wonderful phrase from uh, 13th century Persian poet Jalaluddin Rumi when he says that, Organs of perception coming to being according to necessity, therefore increase your necessity. Um, so when we are perceptive of our needs, then we can we can sometimes uh, make something happen from them. I, I often see it as a spring cleaning, and I sometimes use a metaphor of when you come to clean your house in spring, sometimes you need to take the furniture out to the house before you can give it a good clean. And so I feel that we may be taking the furniture out of the house, uh, use that metaphor, right now in the world. Some things will be a shock, and we do need a shock sometimes. These are catalytic triggers to make us realize that these systems, these models really are not working. Um, because the gradual system change um, doesn't doesn't always make us realize but in fact sometimes gradual change is used in a not so constructive way for example often systems are repatched just like a sinking ship the captain instead of changing the ship for a new model he gets out the the, uh, the bandages and starts to to try to fill up the holes so but you know at the end of the day we're still sailing on a sinking ship so gradual change sometimes can be changed by the incumbent authorities to try to repatch the present model. Um, and that, that may not be constructive. So often, and especially at this moment, when, when um, a lot of our systems are so fragile, we do need a shock in the system to, to actually bring in the real, real change, the constructive and permanent change. So I try to see them as being catalytic and, and positive in the long run. That may not help everyone. The, I, I realize that there are people in the world who are going through very strong personal issues at the moment because of the state of the world. So it, it may not be um, you know, for me to say these are catalytic and they will help you. Um, 
may not be something that everybody wants to hear, but this is my perspective. And if we do really want lasting change in the world, sometimes we need to wait until things come to a head for people on a large scale to really understand. That's one side of the question. On the other side, which is a question, a question that we may explore throughout our conversation, is the rise of consciousness and awareness, which is also bringing in change. So we see many elements at the moment. It, it's, a real, it's a real mixed bag of, of physical change, disruption, consciousness, awareness rising. And this is why it's um, a world shift on a planetary scale and a time which I, I feel is unprecedented and that we've never been at this point before as a global species. Yeah, I, I could see that sometimes this time could be compared to like the transition from the, the Roaring Twenties into the Great Depression, but it has a lot of differences as well. It's, there's, the consciousness is very different. You know, and, and I think the possibilities are very different. That, that the change from the 20s to the, the 40s, there was change, but I don't think it's as dramatic as what we're facing now. So how do you see, you know, humanity's consciousness having evolved from in the last hundred years, like from the industrial age um, to now? And how do you see us evolving in the future, like into 2030 or 2050? Well, that, that's such a... Um so a broad perspective, a huge question, Sibba. Let's take the first part. Now, you mentioned the 20s and the Great Depression. That was a change which I would refer back to bandaging the sinking ship metaphor, in that there wasn't lasting permanent change. Uh, the economic situation was, was recovered from, but it gave greater powers to the Federal Reserve, for example, in America, and it consolidated a lot of economic power into smaller hands. And so, in effect, it, it actually strengthened the current system that was operational. So it wasn't really a major change, um, in my understanding. Now, what's happening now is that the changes going on are affecting people globally. In a, for example, if we look at the system of food, uh, food... Um, the food system is um, worldwide. It actually is controlled by some corporate hands. It also has control of a lot of domestic policy in developing countries. Um, um, domestic uh, food is affected by, uh, let's say, climate disruption. Therefore, and then it's affected by economic speculation and future speculation, commodities buying. Then it's affected by, by the energy industry because, of course, energy, oil, and oil is used for fertilizing in agro-business. Everything's connected, and it affects people around the world, not only producers, but consumers. So the point that I want to stress is that we are now um, living on, on the cusp of a planetary society. So the changes that are happening and the consequences of that change is, is felt worldwide. And, and also it brings on board the participation of people globally. And people are connecting globally. So this is a very different ball game to what I, what I feel are earlier, let's say, events, such as you, one you mentioned in, in the economic uh, crisis of the 20s. Uh, th these didn't have the same convergent uh, effect or consequences. We're now in an area where we are affected on a domino effect and all the systems are affected. So saying that, going back now to the, the issue of consciousness, the Industrial Revolution had a certain mindset which actually it created a kind of techno mindset or a, tech, a technic mindset because the Industrial Revolution urbanized a large part of, of the world, mostly the, the developed nations, because they were the first to go through the Industrial Revolution. So what happened that it brought millions of people from the rural environment, from a, a totally different mindset, who more or less lived by the sun rising and the sun setting, and put them into an urban factory environment 
where then you have scientific management uh, or tailorism coming in and people clocking on and then you have uh, people living by the structure of time and very organized and managed. So the end of that industrial revolution mindset by the end of the 20th century is that we were a very uh, socially managed type of populace in, in much of the developed countries. The way we lived, uh, the growth of the suburbs, the way our time were managed and our, our daily lives were managed. I refer to this um, in some of my earlier work as the uh, living in techno cultures and being of, of the techno mindset. And so that what was a different type of consciousness. But also happening around the same time was a growth in, let's say, the transpersonal consciousness. Because at a, at a similar time, let, let's look at the, uh, let's say, mid to eight 19th century. You had the transcendental movement in America. You had uh, Emerson, uh, Thoreau, and the growth of, of that uh, kind of naturalism transcendental movement. At the same time, you had the growth of uh, theosophy, for example, and Madame Blavatsky, and a, a huge growth in occultism, and especially the occultism that was associated with spiritualism and seances and contacting the dead. And so people's perceptions and worldview actually started to expand to understand that there may be other realities out there at the same time of this industrialization mindset. Then, of course, in the, um, in the early decade of the 20th century, uh, you had the growth of psychoanalysis and Freud and Jung and Reich, who were able to disseminate their ideas of, of the subconscious and elements of our interior being. So for the first time, people were beginning to explore an interior world and an interior mindset. Now, for example, example imagine speaking to your grandparents um, and, and, and saying to them, oh, whoops, I had a Freudian slip. Um, they'd probably look at you and, are you, are you crazy? What's a Freudian slip? So we already started to have this vocabulary about our interior world, which was very new and that generation of the early 20th century began to explore that vocabulary. Then let's take it further. And then in the 1950s, especially in the post-Second World War era, we had a huge influx of Eastern teachings coming into the Western world, um, a huge growth in America. Uh, we had Zen, Buddhism, uh, Sufism, we had such people as Yogananda coming over. We had many Eastern teachers coming over. And so, again, there was a huge growth in interior understanding and traditions uh, coming up in, in the Western world at this time. Then you had um, the 1960s, which was a, a, a kind of evolutionary impulse that the, the seed of growth of consciousness was really planted uh, a lot in that decade. Of course, then you had tran transpersonal psychology, uh, you had um, a lot of people coming out and you had the Esalen Institute in America, you had a lot of consciousness exploration and experimentation, Timothy Leary, the West Coast Movement, uh, Carlos Castaneda, all these things and a lot more happening a great experimentation. So now take this to, um, let's say, the end of the 20th century. So on one hand, we've had the industrial mindset, which really is, is coming, I feel, it's had its peak, it's had its heyday around, I think, the, the 1850s and 1880s, around this time when you had the, the growth of the railroads, the, the growth of the telegraph, and, and this type of technical innovation. And then at the end of the 20th century, we, if we look back, we have a whole wealth of interior information and, and vocabulary. And so 
that brings us on a, on a good footing to try to explore change in our present day now on both an exterior level and an interior level. And that's a significant point because for a permanent planetary world shift to occur, um, we need not to just bandage the, the, the exterior boat and to keep it afloat, we need interior change as well, and quite a significant change on a perceptual level as well as a conscious level. So um, we now have vocabulary for it. The question is, which was the end of your question, <laughs> how do I see the world in 2030 and 2050? That, that's, a, that's a large question. I feel that great change will come from the younger generations coming in. Um, now, young people we have today, they were born into change, the transitional period we're having now. And being born into change when there's a, a kind of tug of war between the old mind and the new mind can be quite an unsettling. And so for many young people, they are feeling this um, vibrational dissonance. And sometimes they're manifesting this through um, disharmonious uh, behavior or feeling just not fitting in. They often feel that school and education is, is not working for them, which is, which is quite right because educational system is also an antiquated model. And so, but on the other hand, some of them are feeling inspired to create innovative change themselves such as uh, the movement um, which originated in the U.S. called Generation Waking Up. One of the originators on that is a young man called Joshua Gorman, who I've been in conversation with, and he's in conversation with young people around the world, and they're feeling, they're feeling inspired. Now, they're the young people making change now, but the young people being born now, who will be the teenagers in 2030, I say that they will be born as change, not so much being born into change, but being born as change. And that's a significant difference. So the question is, what type of consciousness will they have in 2030? Now in 2030, I feel that we are going to see a, a very different um, type of consciousness coming in, a consciousness which is adjusting to a different vibrational presence on the earth. It may, that's, that's a large statement. Uh, it's difficult to, to quantify it, but I do feel that we're going through energetic change as well and vibrational shifts. Because when you shift different models, when you shift your thinking patterns, you then, you then shift the vibrational signature of human thinking. Because human thoughts are energetic uh, vibrational statements. Thoughts are, are vibrational waves, let's say. And we can come back to that, that, that issue, if you wish. So when thinking patterns change, energy vibrations change, and if the young people are picking up on this in 2030, then it will affect their thinking patterns as well. Now, and I also, if new models and way of doing things and social models are online in 2030, then that, that will affect our thinking. And if we can push through positive change and now in this transitional period, then by 2030, I think we would have a lot more positivity in human consciousness because we, can, we will be able to see that these changes have been put into effect. Now, for example, if we, if we don't come out of this, this transitional period in a good way, then we may feel more negative later on, feeling that we haven't made the shift. But I don't feel that's going to happen at all. I feel that we will start to make innovative change, and therefore that will affect the consciousness as a roll-on effect by 2030. I've spoken quite a bit on this. Um, would you like me to speak more and go on about 2050 at the same time? Yes, speak a little bit on 2050. Okay. Now, I do feel it's, it's quite, uh, let's say, it's difficult to speak about the future in a long term. The reason for this is that I sense that we're going through a moment now of exponential change, 
which means it's not linear. Now, when you often when you look at the forecasts from futurists, and a lot of futurists tend to uh, have a type of linear trend forecasts. So they look at the world today and they say, well, based on this, we're going to see this in X years time, um, because it's an extension of present um, events. This perhaps worked um, in the past. And as I mentioned before, often we go through long static periods and then very quick periods of change. In those static periods, you can more easily make um, forecast, what I call extension-based forecasts. You extend on the current trends. But what I feel we're going through is um, an evolutionary moment of rapid change, which means that everything is, is up for accelerated change. And so change is exponential. And if, if, you, if, you, if you are aware of what exponential change is like, for example, a wonderful analogy of exponential change is using a chessboard. And if you say, uh, and this is a story, in fact, it's a story which is well known uh, in the East. And this was when a, the king granted, granted one of his servants any, any, any amount of, of grain that he wished in return for his favours. And the servant said, well, I'll tell you what, let me put one piece of grain on the first square of a chessboard. If you double that piece of grain for each next square, give me the result of that after 64 squares. And the king thought, well, that's an easy enough response. No problem. Of course, the second square is two. You've doubled it. You double it again four for the next square. But um, you, you probably realize that if you keep doubling this, then you get into, into phenomenal numbers. And the end of it, after 64 squares, the end result is there was more grain in all of the world. Not possible for the king to offer this. This is an analogy of exponential change. Now, um, we're dealing with, with huge numbers that change. Um, they, they change because they roll on from each other. Now, change is happening very quickly. Just remember, if we just think back that we had the Internet came online really in the early 1990s, on, on a kind of um, public scale. It was used on a, on, a, on a low scale between scientists before that. The, uh, the first browser, the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee World Wide Web, I think only came online about 96. And here we are, just more or less 15 years later, and, and the World Wide Web has changed the world, changed human behavior, the way we interact. That's an example of exponential change. So I do, I'm quite cautious when looking at 2050 because I'm not sure that anybody can accurately, accurately predict 2050. We, we can try to um, put suppositions and ideas, but I, I feel that we, it's so difficult to say this. So what I will say is I've put out some ideas there. One I, idea is that energy will have to fundamentally change. Because if we are going to exist as a planetary society in 2050, which is an imperative, then we need to shift the way we do energy. And that means the way we extract energy, our energy sources, our energy, distrib our energy distribution, and our whole way of approaching energy. Now, we will need to find new energy sources that will be renewable and find ways of making them work for the world um, and also localized as well. And I do feel that new technology may come on board to actually um, help those new energies to emerge. We will have to find new ways for countries to interact and collaborate together. We cannot be in 2050 in the same way the world is today. So I, 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 in, this, in this period of change, the next 40 years, I refer to this as changing from one set of C values to another set of C values. The earliest set of C values is what we've been using, for example, since the Industrial Revolution and even before. And that is 
conflict, control, and conquest. And we need to shift towards collaboration, communication, consciousness, and compassion. These values are required if we are successfully to emerge as a planetary society around 2050. That means we will have to totally um, recalibrate how we um, negotiate together as a world. And I mean that on a political level between nations. Also between people. People will have to interact differently and communicate differently, which I feel is already happening now through a kind of grassroots, people to people, group to group, um, collaboration and connection. We will have to rethink our resources, how we share those resources. So we go from a, a world of duality, which is some part of the world are, are resource sinks and others are resource exporters, i.e. some are resource givers and others are just resource consumers. We have to share what we have in the world. That will be another aspect that will have to change by 2050. Economics is a huge area. Again, this model, I can't see our present model lasting the end of the decade. And uh, I'm quite surprised that our, our current model is still in place, in fact. It, it really is, I think it's a case of the emperor's new clothes, in that so many countries are tied into an international economy that no one can really um, point the finger and say the, naked, the emperor is naked, because if they do, and the, the uh, international economy starts to collapse, then um, the countries will lose out. I think countries are starting to quietly move out and trying to negotiate their own stability. So the economy will have to change. So I feel that by 2050, we will have moved to a very large degree from a vertical system to a horizontal system. And I'll finish by explaining that. The vertical system is what I sense as being the old model, i.e. it's a top-down, hierarchical, authoritative model. That means the people at the top have the control. Uh, it's like almost like a pyramid structure. They keep a tight management structure. They control the systems. And they give little leeway and little participation to uh, the people at the bottom, i.e. Um, the citizenry, the, the people, the masses. But now, now we have the internet, we have distributed communications, we have people who are connecting between each other, not only politically, but also in trade. People are, uh, there's an increase in cottage industries, people connecting between supply and consumer directly, the growth of eBay, localized energies, people creating energy in their communities. This is a horizontal level where people are connecting between themselves. And I feel that model is going to increase to a large degree. So by 2050, I would sense that we would have moved to a large degree from a, from a vertical model to a horizontal model. How that plays out in specifics um, we, we will have to see as, as the next years unfold. That makes a lot of sense, and I, I look forward to that. That sounds so much more humane. Then I have a, a question It's kind of pulling back a little more to the now of we have shocks going on, and then we need to respond to these shocks in, in different ways that are conscious or productive or seeing new things in it. So, like, how do we be with something like the events of the uh, Boston Marathon uh, explosions? My sense is that um, it's, it's critical how we respond. Um, it's not so much what happens to us, but how we respond to something which really marks us and, and for me, gives us a sense of being. And so um, that, that's, a, that's a good question in terms of what's happening today. The my first initial response would be to say we should not respond or react in fear 
or negativity or frustration or anxiety. Because those types of responses, emotions and mental sets are debilitating. If, if we have fear in our mind, our body, in our emotions, we are already operating at a lower efficiency. Um, this is being tested by muscle reaction, for example. People have, for example, given people images of fear or, or words of fear and then tested their muscle strength and it, the results are quite um, astonishing. We have low, low strength, low, low, low response mechanisms. What's happening through the mainstream media through um, and, and showing global events is that on one level, it's, it's creating a reaction of, of frustration and anger and fear, and this is not constructive. But if we look at actually what else is happening, we will see that after these great, after these events, these, these horrific events, such as what happened at the Boston Marathon and at other events um, like Sandy Hook and others around the world, is that there's been a great rallying of people, people showing great empathy, compassion, and saying that we are going to rise above this. And if you, if you look at that and, and focus on that, for me, it, my hair stands on end. It gives me goosebumps when I, when I, when I see this emotion from people. That is the real heart of humanity. The ability to respond to crises or negativity with something powerfully human, constructive and positive. Now, I talk about the metaphor of fear as, as something material and that fear and negativity wants to be, wants to be a part of our lives because it, it, it actually, in reality, it doesn't have that much power. So it tries to pretend it's larger than it is. For example, if we are in a darkened room and there's no light, we sense that everything's dark, completely dark, 100%, and it feels as if the darkness is powerful. But all we have to do is light, strike one tiny match, and it illuminates the room. The darkness can be can be uh, taken away with just a little match. That's the power of light. So the way to respond is to overcome, to put in human positivity and say, well, this has happened. We can't change what has happened. The only thing that we can change is how we respond to it. And to respond constructively is for me the only way to go beyond uh, these moments of negativity. Now. I feel that there, there will be more disruption down the line, especially in 2013. There will be perhaps individuals trying to create havoc. There may be um, organizations or even nations who are trying to either maintain the status quo, resist change, or perhaps even to the point of intentionally creating anxiety so people may, may wish to be passive and not create change between themselves. All these are possibilities. But the only way to respond to that, to create change, is to participate with the, uh, the new C values I mentioned before. And so what's important today is that we are more of a participatory culture through our social media, through our distributed communications. We can reach out and connect just as we're doing now through Skype, now having a conversation, we can we can connect with each other. We don't have to wait for a, a government message or a mainstream news service to, to send out the news. So the, the question I would send out is, we have this responsibility. We have this power and potential in our hands. So what type of message do you want to give? What type of response do you want to give to these disruptive events? And, and we, we can certainly move beyond these events and don't let them take up the whole screen. And um, that, that would be my answer to that. Thank you. Yeah, it's when it first happened, I, my, my, my inner response was we're just in a time when shit happens. 
And so instead of looking at, you know, who did it or why or whatever, it's like shit happens and we take care of each other. And yeah. that was a different response for me. And I think I'm going to stick with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good response. And, uh, and if I can ask you, do you feel that you would have had the same response 10 years ago to that to the same event? No. No, I mean, 10 years ago is about, you know, when we had 9-11 and we were mm -hmm. like, who did it and why and and who do, who, does, who do we blame and how do we fight back? Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, I, I saw with the Boston Marathon, people who had, they'd never met each other before, saving each other's lives and helping each other. And that's what stuck out for me. And then I could see, you know, in the media how they were, in the images is, it's almost like they were trying to create this fear or shock wave. And it's like, I don't want to do that. You know, I want to treat it like, you know, a hurricane happened or whatever happened and we pick up, mm -hmm. you know, that that's kind of where I came from. And it's interesting you hear you say that. Because um, I, I noticed the same thing is that people's responses are different than, say, 10 years ago or 9-11. And that is a good, a good indication of where we're moving towards. Just pointing the finger, go and finding someone and stopping them up, and then saying, we found the culprit, um, back to business as usual. That's not gonna work with that's not gonna work with people anymore. And people don't want that type of response. So it's interesting that you're noting that, we're seeing that, and that's that that's indication of, of already how the transition has played out. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kingsley, this is Chipper. I, the way you described the three C's previously, are and the turning it into the three or the four C's that you touched on, and recognizing the role played by the internet, would that be sort of a physical representation of the global empathic mind or a, a potentiation of that empathic tendency? Hi, Chipper. Uh, thanks for the question. And exactly so. Yes. We can see changes both in terms of consciousness and values and in terms of physical uh, validated change. And that's something which I try to focus on in that when I look at change, not only is it subjective, but to try to point out at the physical change. Now, the global empathic mind, for me, is a, a, a representation of the shifting of those values. Now, part of that is coming out from the physicality of our technologies, uh, specifically our communication technologies, that we, can, we are connecting people across the world. Many people nowadays are talking with strangers. Young people are connecting with, with friends. And they're opening it up, opening it up and talking to friends across the world in, in ways that perhaps they wouldn't open up to uh, their classmates or someone next door to them because there's a sense of, for many people, uh, freedom in communicating with so-called strangers or people at a distance. Now, I've looked into a lot of research um, about people's behavior from communication, um, a lot from my days in the sociology department at Lancaster University. And there were a lot of indications of, of um, people feeling the ability to open up to people and responding and making friendships and empathizing with people. So um, you have now people, for example, in Iran creating Facebook pages such as We Love Israel and vice versa in Israel and people connecting and making friendships and saying, look, you know, we don't have the same mindset as our governments or what's portrayed in the media. We want to make friends. They're empathizing with each other. That has a physical expression. Now, I know there's a lot of um, unsavory aspects along the technologies. That's a different conversation. I do recognize them. I, I do recognize that they're in play, a lot of surveillance technologies. Um, but the question is, through this transition, what type of model is going to win out? And over time, I do feel that the, the constructive empathic model will finally win out. But through the through this transition, we will have certain models in contestation. But what I prefer to do is focus on the positive signs, um, Chipper. Another sign also, which is a physical indication, 
is through neuroscience. And neuroscience has, and also the work, for example, of Daniel Siegel, such as uh, his work on Mindsight, has noticed that um, people's neurons are reconnecting their pathways in their head according to activity. As they say, that neurons wire as neurons fire. So if our neurons are firing in a different way, they wire up in a different way. So because our using of, of technologies, being multitasking, connecting with many people, that's rewiring our brains to be in a responsive mode to, in a way, to many people beyond the physicality. Another aspect is mirror neurons. Mirror neurons, are you aware of this, Chipper? You, you're nodding your, I heard it. Uh-huh. <laughs> mirror neurons is when a scientist noticed that through their research, is that our, our neurons in our head, when we observe another person, and this is also the same in certain mammals, such as monkeys, that when we observe another person in an activity, such as eating, for example, the same neurons in our head fire as if we were eating, although we are not. It's almost as if we are mimicking them. That means that we are empathizing with their activity and we are resonating and almost recreating the same activity in our head. This may account, for example, if we go to a, watch a, a movie and there's a sad moment and we start to cry. We can't help it because we are empathizing with the person on the screen because our neurons are, are firing in the same pattern. Now, that's happening in the way I feel that people are connecting around the world. We have a, an event, we have, you know, we have events, let's say, um, food crises in, in developing countries, we have conflict crises in many countries, and people are empathizing with that because somehow their neurons and their brains are reacting. So to answer your question, David, there's a very physical response to the global empathic mind. It's not just an ethereal or consciousness or energetic right. response. Yeah. Right. It's not just a vibratory response. It's an That's actual, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I, I ran into V.S. Ramachandran um, a few years back and was just astounded by some of his presentations with those mirror neurons. And what that spoke to me of is that We've got we've got the equipment, the brain equipment, to be as empathic as we choose. Mm-hmm. Yep, and and the that it's interesting that a lot of new knowledge and new science is coming out now, which is which is validating this and giving us the tools and the vocabulary to understand and express it. We can look at the new sciences also. Uh, The new sciences, the quantum physics, which are looking at how the matter is a manifestation of an underlying energetic field or quantum field. Um, I've been recently um, writing and researching on the, with my colleague Erwin Laszlo, what we call the Akashic field. And so um, looking at this energetic field underlying all contact, therefore we are in contact um, non-locally. Right. So the question is, how does that manifest physically? If we have a, a strong thought or an emotion, that connects non-lo- non-locally with others. So therefore, we do now have an understanding that we are connected, and that should impact our values, our ethics, our responsibilities. So the new scientists, I think, are converging the world of, let's say, consciousness or the non-visible world with our understanding of materiality and matter. So... That, I think we're now merging that vocabulary as well and giving us a broader perspective and understanding. Jim. Well, that brings a question about communication. I mean, you, if we recognize the, the, the reality of that connectedness, what kind of terminology change is going to facilitate that? Will we need a new vocabulary? Are we going to have to just bring that online as we realize that the old words and the old descriptions don't work? Yes, I I feel that we are naturally going to start to use a new vocabulary or understand vocabulary 
in a new way, a new interpretation. So, for example, I, when I'm in conversation with people and I talk about the, the, the issues that I'm interested in, I, I say to them, look, you know, I'm not talking about the new age. You know, this is not the 1960s, 70s. What I'm talking about is the new normal. <laughs> you know, what we have to do is normalize these issues. And so we can speak about them. Right. Now, you know, if, I, if we're having a conversation and we use the word spirituality, some people may be put off by that, or they may go directly into a, a, into a mindset of spirituality. They're talking about having, um, let's say, uh, spiritual beliefs or esotericism or something connected with a religious understanding, etc. But really, for me, spirituality is a sense of one's well-being. And, you know, and I was speaking recently with a, a friend of mine who's a, a retired medical doctor, and we're talking about spirituality, and he had the same epiphany, if you will. He was saying, I speak with other doctors and patients, and I want to speak about spirituality, but I, I feel I can't. But if I listen to people, I realize that they're talking about the same thing that I would call spirituality, but what they call it is well-being. <laughs> So, yes. you know, if we're talking about inner well-being and therefore our harmonious and coherent relationship to the world around us, that for me, we're talking about something spiritual. So that, I think we have to understand things in a new way as well as use a new vocabulary. And I think that that's going to start to happen as, as we start to validate, perhaps through science, and the new sciences will validate what we once called esoteric, so it will normalize it. And so when I have conversations such as we're having today, my, my main imperative is to normalize these things, normalize things of the human spirit, of human energy and vibration, so, so people can talk about it without being worried that the person next door is going to look at them strangely. <laughs> Well, I just I just wonder if the, the what you spoke of the quantum field and uh, if you being the basis for the physicality, could that also equate to the the new phrase for spirituality, which would be em empathic recognition of that connectedness? I mean, mm -hmm. we're we're seeing it physically, and we're seeing the tangled quarks showing us that physicality of that spiritual phrase from the old paradigm and i'm i'm just wondering if what we have found out about how the mind works how the mirror neurons work and how the the vibratory state of an individual holding holistic and and well-being thoughts versus anger or territorial or or whatever other types there are. Yes, Japan, and a lot of these findings have already been been validated and out and are out there. They're just perhaps not so publicly known. I think it was David Hawkins who, through his work Power and Force, looked at how certain sort of vocabulary and, and mindsets uh, would affect the world around us and our, affect our physical body as well. And also, if you look at the work of Larry Dossey, the medical doctor, he, he now uses the term non-local medicine. Uh, he calls it era, era three medicine, and that we moved from era one to era two to now era three, which he calls non-local, which is a quantum physicist term. And so what, what we need now is more credible pioneers, credible people, credible researchers, connecting the dots and validating that so people can be almost, people need to be assured that these things are credible and are not fringe ideas. And so this may take a little time, but the more, more people who talk about the quantum underlying field in medicine, in communications, in neuroscience, in consciousness studies, then this will become more mainstream. And, and as you know, uh, uh, paradigm shifts they occur when the, the anomalies start to become so numerous that the current system can't, can't 
ignore them, they have to incorporate them, and therefore this, the, the whole system sh shifts and changes. So this has almost been the case in many scientific paradigm shifts, going back to you know, the, the, the shift from flat Earth to round Earth, or the shift from uh, you know, the Earth being the center of the solar system, or even center of the universe. So science or human investigation and human understanding has to validate this, and then we have a we have a kind of consciousness um, reaction, and then our perceptions change, our vocabulary changes, and uh, we are seeing that today. We are beginning to normalize um, normalize, I think, these this under underlying energetic fields and this understanding. So. We, in the next years, in the next decades, um, by 2030 and onwards, that's part of the shift that I envision. People recognizing and, let's say, people acknowledging that we are part of a unified collective energetic field. Yeah, and operating from it as well. Yeah, and hopefully that will then um, feed back in how we consider our ethics, our behavior, and our humanity, and that hopefully will then bring online the values of collaboration and, and compassion and consciousness, because why should we conflict with each other when, in effect, we are all part of the same unity? Right. How do you see our pattern of consciousness needing to evolve or change in regards to what we've just been talking about? Because that that's going to be a concurrent activity along with developing that new vocabulary and that that new understand that new acknowledgement of that connectedness indeed we can't have um, a new vocabulary or a faith in new vocabulary if we don't have a new consciousness that comes along with it now my understanding is that rather than consciousness actually changing uh, so to speak, it's our understanding and reception of consciousness. Now, going back to um, the question of how was our consciousness in the Industrial Revolution or before, we, we've been having you know, centuries of the consciousness, consciousness pattern of the Descartes, I think, therefore I am. That's been our consciousness for a long time. But, you know, we ha so we've assumed that we have consciousness and we think. And that consciousness is inside of us. Now, my understanding, and not, this may not be shared by everybody, my understanding and intuition is that actually consciousness is external to us. And non what we, exactly, non local, and what we do is that we receive it. So the analogy is like a TV set, in that um, perhaps if we place a TV set in, in the middle of a, of a, Let's say if we went back in time and placed it in the middle of a tribe a few hundred years ago, they would think that the pictures were inside of the television. And of course, we think we know better. Right. Um, now, using that, using that analogy, the pictures are not in the television. They are broadcast and the television receives them and interprets them. And I feel that the brain is very similar in that. The brain is a receptive apparatus. It's also an interpretive apparatus because it has the sense uh, faculties to do that. So, you know, we know from science that reality is waves and we don't, we don't particularly understand that. We say, oh, reality is waves, but that's okay because it's still physical. What happens is that our brain receives the waves and interprets them and consciousness likewise are external energies that we pick up on. And therefore, um, we sometimes have inspiration. We sometimes have uh, thoughts all of a sudden. Now, also, if we look at um, the way of inventions, we, we had the idea that inventions arose within lone individuals. But now we know through, through historical investigators that inventions cropped up within several minds simultaneously. It wasn't just Darwin alone who had the theory of evolution. It wasn't only Newton who came up with calculus at the same time. It wasn't one person who came up with the radar or the television at the same time. 
multiple people were working on these ideas at the same time. My feeling is that at certain moments, human, humanity is, let's say, more, is more receptive to a certain level of ideas or certain frequency of ideas. And at that time, we are able to pick up on them, internalize them, and then interpret them. And so, uh, to answer your question, the understanding of a new vocabulary, the understanding of the future, will have to go along with an understanding that humanity connects to the unified field and connects to a unified consciousness by, by picking up the signals, just like an antennae, and receiving those signals and interpreting them. We interpret it through our, our personality and, and through our own states and vibrational states. So therefore, of course, people's levels of, of perception and understanding are different. Our vehicle of interpretation is different, such as not everybody has the same model of television. But so I do feel, you know, we, we will move more towards that shift in recognizing the origin of consciousness. I completely agree with that sentiment. Thank you for that answer. Thank you, Jacob. Kingsley, this is Susan. You've mentioned a couple of things. I'd like to maybe flesh it out a bit. You've spoken of an epoch of change and non-local connections, and you've also mentioned energy and vibrations. How do you see energy and vibrations in this epoch of change? Well, hi, Susan. Um, energy, change, frequency, for me, everything is energy. Mm. From a physical basis that we, um, we've already talked about being the, the quantum field and that um, if we understand that consciousness, energy and consciousness um, together is primary and therefore matter is secondary, then we understand right. that energy is the underlying principle of our lives. And so, but also, um, what an element which we often don't talk about when we discuss the world is that the world is an open system. Mm. It's, not a cl it's not a closed system. We don't have the, um, the biosphere and then um, the ionosphere, and then basically we are closed off to the energies outside of us. We are here because we receive solar radiation. We receive galactic plasma energies. We are here, the Earth is alive because it receives energy from outside of itself. Um, and we, so I think we should recognize that in our vocabulary when we come to discuss the Earth systems, uh, nature, environmental systems, because we talk about these systems as though, as though they are part of a closed system. And so, oh, it's humanity's fault only because humanity does this, this system changes, and if we tweak this, if we geoengineer this upon the Earth, everything will be fine. It's like, whoa, um, step back a bit. You know, have, you you know, have you taken into account that there's other factors a part of the equation, and they are outside of the Earth? So we, we start to recognize that in terms of our climate because some investigators are saying, well, let's look at the impact of solar radiation and um, the solar sun cycles and um, solar flares, and that these have an impact upon the Earth. And in fact, there's a, lot, there's a number of evolutionary theorists who actually feel that the solar cycles and the solar energy are the main drivers in evolutionary tipping points and evolutionary change. And they are trying to do a they are trying to do a study of um, this. It's difficult because we can only study the sun according to our, our scientific devices. If we could go back in history, we may find out that if we had the means to record solar cycles and solar activity we could make a, a comparable a check with evolutionary uh, moments. But of course, we can't go that far back in terms of our science. Now, the sun gives up a lot of extreme solar radiation, which is 
uh, it's imperative for the survival of this planet. At the same time, the sun receives um, gamma radiation from, this, from our galaxy, and specifically from the center of our galaxy, which is a black hole. And black holes are still not, not that well understood. They are now largely understood by mainstream science to be um, basically pumps, almost huge energy pumps, pumping out gamma rays, electromagnetic um, waves. And this huge heartbeat of the galaxy, hmm. it actually feeds the stars. And then science has now realized, and um, we've written, Urban Laszlo and myself have written about this in our latest book, that organic molecules are created within stars. Stars are creators of a life. Now, then stars emit organic molecules, they emit energy, which then impacts planets, and I would say are main drivers behind life and evolution on planets. So that is another issue of energy, Susan. So we, if we're having a different solar mood, let's say, or um, the solar system does go through larger cycles and spirals, if the solar system is moving through a different energetic neighborhood, so to speak, then that will affect the energies arriving on our planet Earth. Though the question is, the human body is, our nervous system is also an electromagnetic antennae. We can go back and verify that by biophysics. Biophysicists, and such as the work as Mei Wan Ho and Fritz Pop, have found out that our human DNA um, emits biophotons, which are in a quantum field. So our body is a quantum field of light, which then responds to the energetic environment beyond us, outside of us. So the question is, if we're talking about human consciousness changing, which goes back to the question of the, the changing of our human nervous system and our brain that receives human consciousness, how is our human nervous system and our human physiology being impacted by the changing energetic environment of our Earth, which is impacted through the sun, which is further impacted through the galaxy? To go beyond that, or rather to take it the other way, below our feet, the core of our Earth is also giving off an electromagnetic energy through the, the core of our spin, of the core Earth. And in fact, now scientists have realized that the inner core has two layers, the second inner layer and the, the primary inner layer. The secondary inner layer is, is the molten part, and they feel that the inner layer is more solid and almost a kind of magnet. Now, we're receiving energy from the Earth, and that can be talked about in ley lines and and certain energy grids. So all this is impacting the human body and therefore is impacting how we receive and interpret consciousness. So that energy question is primary and um, is, is a, you know, where do we stop, Susan? <laughs> Was that similar to your feelings and your, the, 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 how you felt that you were posing a question, Susan? Uh, yes, th this goes along exactly with what I've been picking up, sensing, reading from other people. And it's like we have to move beyond a view of the Earth is flat or we're the center of the universe and come to a much larger picture that incorporates the sun as an energetic consciousness, perhaps, as well as the stars, and perhaps, too, that we're moving through a place in the universe we've never been before. And also, this leads into another question I have and would like to put to you about Earth changes, potential Earth changes, since all these new energies are coming in, the vibrations are changing, and here we are in our human bodies, and uh, I don't see how we cannot be impacted or 
that the earth could not be impacted. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I totally agree that the earth changes uh, are also a response to a shift in the energetic environment. Now, the earth changes, they have multiple causes. Uh, I'm not denying that humanity has affected earth changes, such as our cutting down of, of the rainforest and um, our destru- destruction of topsoil and, um, and desertification and pollution, etc. Now, these things are happening and do affect the climate and earth changes. But it's, it's not um, the whole picture. The, the earth changes are so on a large scale and so dramatic that they are part of a much grander process. And part of this is the changing energy which is coming from the sun. Some astronomers are saying, as I mentioned in the last question, that the solar system is moving towards a different energetic environment which is more energized. Some have referred to this as the dark rift. So, and they, of course, the, the, the sun does have these cycles which are, goes through greater peaks of activity. These affect the Earth. Also, the Earth has its own cycles. The Earth has large, large water cycles, for example. When, if you look, if you have read history and, and his, geolo- geological history, the Earth has gone through water cycles over vast stretches of time. And what this means is that for some reason, um, the Earth starts to sh- um, melt the ice from the caps, change, changing the flow of the water, and therefore that affects the land mass. It also has a, an effect upon the magnetic north and south pole, which then, of course, um, has an effect on many things, such as sea level rise and affecting coastal regions, tectonic plate um, being affected. And so this is part of Earth changes. People are talking about global warming. Well, are we talking about global cooling? If we are going towards a different, a new water cycle, which some some speculate, what it shows us is that really we don't have much of a clue what's going on. Um, and which it may be easy to point the finger and say humanity is a part of humanity is to blame because then we say, oh, we'll tweak it, we'll fix it. That again is you know is part of the, the closed system mentality. If we if we put um, if we spray iron filings in the atmosphere to reflect the sun, um, we'll be okay. You know, it's like, well, you know, we're trying to solve things with an old mind. As Einstein so rightly said, um, you you can't create solutions with the same old mind that created the solutions, created the problems in the first place. Um, so. The Earth changes are part of a larger, much larger process, and they are going to affect us. We are going to have geographical effects, which will have an effect on demographics, people movement, people moving from lower lying areas such as Bangladesh, for for example, has been um, greatly affected. A lot of the islands have been affected. We are going to These are called climate migrants, for for example, in in that sociology speak. (laughs) Of course, that's going to affect the economy because if we have these earth changes, they will affect our food systems. Recently, we've had droughts in Australia and Russia and the US affecting major food growing regions that then affect our um, prices of staple, staple foods. The Arab Spring in January, I think, 2011, the Arab Spring was created mainly out of frustration at the rise of staple commodities in the Middle East countries, such as Tunisia and Jordan and Egypt. The price of bread and and other staple foods, corn, for example, had shot up radically because of the climate um, earth changes affecting our food system. Now, that's the effect because our food systems are so centralized, monopolized, and controlled. They are, they are inherently unstable and not resilient to a changing world. So 
the question is, we know earth changes are happening. We may not totally understand what's causing them. So we should move, this is my understanding, by the way, we should move from a position of human hubris and say, mm. oh, oh, we can change this. Let, let's just change the, uh, the source of what we feel are the global problems. We should say, no. In fact, we should look at what's going to be some of the consequences and change our models and social systems to recalibrate to some of those effects that we're going to see in the, in the years and decades ahead. That's how we should be responding to the, to the uh, earth changes and not trying to run around like, um, like infants thinking that we're going to bang a, a square brick through a round hole, Susan. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned the element of water and how fundamental change on earth is correlated with water. And actually, symbolically, water is seen as the psyche. And I wonder if, if we can make this leap of imagination to seeing that there's no differentiation between water, psyche, earth, human, if that might be part of this epoch of change we need to go through. And that will then help us adapt. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful thought. And I would add to that that water... Uh, can also be related to being a feminine element and the issue and the values of feminine values of nurturance of life giving sustainability. What I would say is with the psych and the water um, analogy is we need to move towards embracing uh, a greater balance between the masculine and feminine ele energies in the world and to to also increase the exposure and the, 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 the element and the presence of feminine energies in the world. We've had a, a very patriarchally based uh, societies which have been behind a lot of these C values of, of competition and conflict. We need to reach out to a lot of the um, so far still unheard voices of the world, reach out to people who can bring the values of sustainability, nurturance, um, collaboration, and and maybe the feminine values. And I do feel that perhaps, I don't want to name it or to categorize it, but to go towards a planetary society, to go towards 2050, which was an earlier question, is that we need to see the rise of uh, feminine values and the appreciation and support of that ahead, Susan. Uh, I just, if I was there, I'd give you a big kiss on the cheek for that <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. I'd give, you a, I'd give it, you a great hug back as well, a big, big hug. Yeah, because mm -hmm. this is so apparent, these qualities that we, we call the feminine, whether they're in men or women, and I very much appreciated that you spoke of those who are unseen or unheard, because sometimes color or culture differentiations um, suppress, are suppressing so many that have so much to offer. And so I think it's time that we, we get back to relationship and tenderness and are no differentiation. There is no I and thou, there is only we. So um, very much appreciated, Kingsley. Yes, yeah, so and that's the, the, the important word you mentioned there is we. Um, we need to be part of the we generation now. Uh, we need to move aside from this sense of duality, this, especially the categorization of, of me, um, masculine and feminine values. As you rightly said, feminine values are feminine values, whether they exist in, in men also or not. We need to embrace the unity and understand that masculine and feminine values both have a role together in unity and not to... Not to bring them into duality and, and that, that's important that as well to understand that wonderful and uh, I, I think the birds are singing with you in agreement behind you just to prove that the earth is <laughs> in this conversation as well thank you yeah, you're welcome now, the birds of Andalusia are outside singing along indeed lovely
Kingsley, would you tell us about your website and uh, any information you'd like to direct people to on, on your website? Thank you, Susan. Yes, I, I, my website is my name, kingsleydennis.com. You can just Google my name, Kingsley Dennis. Uh, luckily, there's not many of us out there, and <laughs> you can find it quite easily. I, I put a lot of material on the website. I, I have many articles free for downloading. I have articles in Spanish and French, and also I put out a newsletter every month, which I write an article for, and also I put out uh, news links and, and web links and video links. So um, that my web page is like my word where I exist on the web, and you can find out a lot more from me and what I've written about there. And please, I try to provide everything just for free to take so people can inform themselves. And I'd also like to mention you're on Facebook, which I find very handy because um, you link new things that come up for you. So I'd encourage people who are interested in your work to um, sign up for your Facebook page, too. This concludes part one of two of our symposium with Kingsley Dennis. <laughs> <laughs>